your Bibles to John chapter 10, please. John chapter 10. They listen to you better than they listen to me. <laughs> they have a safe or a saying, you know, it's like herding cats. <laughs> Kids are easier to herd than cats. I know this. But, uh, got to make sure that you have a shepherd. <laughs> so. I just love uh, having kids in our church. You know, I've visited other small churches and other places, and one of the things I've realized about many small churches, they don't have children, they have youth. And you realize they're, you know, they're, just, they're just not very long away from ceasing to exist. And so I love that a large part of our church are youth. And it really just gives me a lot of a hopeful outlook for the future. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, so I just love love our kids. We have just the most precious young people and the really best teenagers in the world in our youth group. And I hope that you get to know them and invest in their lives and, and uh, realize the value of your investment. When you get older, I think you become a little more nostalgic. And you remember your youth and the people and the things that influenced you. And there are just some people that God blessed me to have invested in my life when I was a young person. And the older I get, the more I realize how much I was helped by them. The more I realize how valuable it is, how important it is, the little things that you do to invest in people's lives. And every one of us ought to be mentors in that sense. And the Bible teaches that we ought to be teachers. And mentors a teacher, a teacher that teaches people how to live and so grow in grace, grow in Christ Jesus, and teach young people what that is. And, uh, even teach them, you know, this is not the way to go. That's the way, this is what I didn't know when I was your age and wish I could do. And talk, speak to young people. Because you just be amazed at how much they listen. Yeah, that you, just, you just think they're not listening, but they are. And they're being affected and influenced. Well, you found John chapter 10 in the scripture. Let's go ahead and read our... A text this morning. What I would like to do actually is just read the first verse and then go down to verses 19 through 21 and read the response to ultimately what Jesus told his disciples. Verily, verily, I say unto you that he that, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And then if you will go down please, to verse 19. There was a division therefore among the Jews for these sayings, and many of them said, He hath the devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Father, please help us today to see that you are the door and that you are the only door and that anyone who proposes any other way is a thief and a robber. And God, I pray that you would help us to know with certainty that we've entered through the door and that that's the only way. And help us as well to be able to understand with clarity that any other way is no way at all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the context here is reminded... <clears throat> Or we're reminded of our context when we read the question that the people who are saying Jesus isn't mad and the evidence that Jesus is not mad or crazy is what? Can a crazy man open the eyes of the blind? In other words, what Jesus was doing was extreme. Have you ever seen somebody do something and you use the term, that's crazy? Uh, you ever saw somebody that just, you know, they uh, maybe in, in sports, athletically, they uh, performed in, and the way they performed was just like, whoa, that's amazing, that's crazy. How they, anybody could do that. Well, that's not the way they're using the word mad here. They're meaning out of his head, he's a nut job, he's, he's crazy. And why do they think he's crazy? Well, because they understood very clearly that he believed that he was God. And if you met someone that believed that they were God, would they be mad? Well, they certainly would be. But the problem with calling Jesus mad was that He opened the eyes of the blind. If you were here last week, you know that that was our context. We looked at the man who was blind from birth for the glory of God. 
and how that Jesus' disciples, as he was passing by, he stopped, looked at the blind man, and his disciples, while he's stopping before this blind man, said to him, was this man, what's the reason for his blindness? Was he blind because of his sin or for his parents' sin that he was born blind? And Jesus, of course, explained that he was not born blind because of anyone's sin. He was born because he had a purpose. God was going to be glorified through him in his blindness. And uh, the, you remember the whole scenario, how it unfolded. Jesus spit on the ground. He made clay, put on the blind man's eyes. He said, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. blind man went and washed himself in the pool of Siloam, and he received his sight. And now it's on the Sabbath day, and people are seeing him, observing. Isn't this the guy that was blind? You know, he, he's never seen in his life. What, how, does, how does he have his sight? And so they ask him how he's healed, and he gives them the whole, you know, a man, I don't know who he was, but a man spit on the ground, he made clay, man made clay, put him on my eyes, told me to go wash myself in the pool of Siloam, and I did, and now I can see. Oh, well, he's a sinner because he healed your eyes on the Sabbath day. Well, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but he healed my eyes. And so they call his parents. What happened to him? Call him into the synagogue, and, well, you know, he's of age, ask him, because if they were to say what happened to him, then they would try to uh, say that they're following Jesus also, and they get kicked out of the synagogue. And so, well, he's of age, ask him. And so they ask him the third time, the blind man, how did you receive your sight? And he said, why, are you going to follow him? Are you? Do you want to know? So I've already told you. You want to hear the story again? Is it because you want to be his disciples? Is that why you're asking me the question? And uh, then they said, well, he's a sinner. You say he's a sinner. And he said, well, it's a marvelous thing. It's this amazing thing that you think that he's a sinner. And he said, we know God doesn't hear the prayer of sinners, but we know that God heard his prayer because God gave him the ability to heal my eyes. I, of course, this is a terrible Pastor Price summary, but I'm trying to get through it quickly so we can get into our context today. And, uh, you know, so he says, this is incredible. You know, God doesn't hear sinners, but God heard him. And you say he's a sinner. And they say, well, you're going to be his disciple. And, you know, and, they, and so they kicked him out of the synagogue. And then Jesus found him. Jesus found him. He met Jesus. And he became a disciple of Jesus. Now that fits within our context of this portion of John that we've been in hitherto, and we're really kind of transitioning from now. Up to this point, we have seen the Gospel of John showing us, in contrast with the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not in contrast as indifferently, but he's been showing us how to believe in Jesus. You know John chapter 20, 30, and 31. Uh, many other things have I written into you. But these things have been written that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Now, I said that quickly, but the theme of John is believing you might have life in His name. John's Gospel is written differently than Matthew, Mark's, and Luke's. It's not presenting Jesus Christ and everything He did and said and was, and that's uh, the Gospel, the Gospel, of course, being Jesus. But John's Gospel is this is how to receive Jesus. So we've been in a series, and a little bit of an interlude here, uh, of a series of how people met Jesus, how they came to believe in Jesus. We saw Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a religious man, ruler Jews, and we saw how he was saved. We saw the Samaritan woman, a woman who had been had five husbands, was living with a man that wasn't her husband, and how she met Jesus, and how she was saved. We saw the people coming down from the village of Samaria, outside of the town where the well of Sychar was. And we saw how that, not only did they come and hear what the woman said about Jesus, but they heard Him with their own ears, and after hearing it themselves, they said, we believe not because of what you told us, we believe because we've heard Him ourselves. And we saw how that they were saved. And uh, we saw the woman who was taken in adultery and how that she came to Jesus. And when no man could condemn her, the only one who had the right to condemn her forgave her and she was saved. And so we've seen thus far really an amalgamation, a real conglomeration of all the different types of people that Jesus saves. What kind of people does Jesus save? Sinners. sinners. What kind of people are sinners? Everyone. Everyone. And so all walks of life, religious, non-religious, uh, all types of society, low and high, Jesus saves sinners. By the way, I got a cool picture to show you about that this evening if you come to the service tonight. I got a neat picture uh, that I'd like to show you about a sinner that Jesus saved that people didn't think ever existed and so forth. It's a good story. Uh, anyway, Jesus saves sinners and he has just saved a blind man. You know, the tragedy of it, though, is the blind man's parents. You know, I left 
uh, last week. And the Sunday night, a lot of times, you know, when you preach a message, you preach it to yourself. And you, you kind of get the same things that you're preaching to others. And Sunday night, even last week, as I was reflecting on last week's message, I was just thinking of the tragedy of the blind man's parents. I, I hope they got saved. But you know, just because they're afraid of getting kicked out of the synagogue, just because of that, they didn't want to answer the questions. Now, what kind of parents? Your son was blind and he received his sight? Most parents I know would be more thankful than the child. Hmm. Isn't it so? But because they were so afraid of the religion of the day, they were afraid of the Jews and being kicked out of the synagogue, they said, he's of age, ask him. And I just feel like if I were the parent, I'd say, well, you know what? I saw him when he was blind, and I see him now that he sees, and anybody that could heal a blind man has got to be God. Thank you, God. I hope that his parents got saved, but one of the things that has been the sad undertone, as we've seen individuals that Jesus saves, we've also seen individuals that refuse to follow Jesus, refuse to believe in Jesus. It's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy that is unnecessary. It's a tragedy God doesn't want, but the reality of it is that every time the gospel is preached, individuals are faced with a choice, with a decision of receiving or rejecting it. And if you're here this morning, can I say to you that we're going to hear the gospel today again preached. Jesus is going to explain it to His disciples. And it will be either a triumph or a tragedy on the basis of how you receive it here this morning. You must be born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And if you're here today and you don't like the message because of something, whether it be religion, whether it be fear, Whatever it is, friend, the truth of it is unchanging. You must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's a, this is a vital message. You're here today and you're a believer in Jesus. We cannot dilute, we cannot water down this message. It must be very, very plainly declared and set forth as Jesus said today. In, in our context. And let's just look at it. I want to look at specifically the statements that Jesus made. Mostly they are I am statements, but sometimes it's I'm going to or this is, this is what, I, what I do because of who I am. But I want to look at the statements Jesus made today. And He begins with the verily, verily, I say unto you. When you see verily, the word behind it is amen. Amen, amen. The word we, that we say for amen. And it is one of those, you know, confirmations. Uh, if I were to say Golden State Warriors are going to sweep the Toronto Raptors in the NBA uh, Finals, you know, well, you'd either agree or disagree with that. I don't think they're going to sweep them. But if I were to say something like that, either you wholeheartedly agree or you disagree. But if you agreed, you could say, Amen. In other words, those are my sentiments exactly. That's what I hope to. Now, when Jesus said amen, it had a little more force to it. First of all, it was amen, amen, or verily, verily. And it was a statement of truth. In other words, not only is this true, but I assent to it. I, I stand behind it. This is, this is very true. And it's very, very true, what I'm saying. And so that's the way Jesus begins this statement. And when He begins a statement like this, his emphasis, the, how emphatic he is about saying it, would instantly garner the attention of the disciples. In a, in a heartbeat, when he says, Verily, verily, or Amen, Amen, then his disciples would snap to attention and say, He's about to give us something from God. It's like a prophet coming and saying, Thus saith the Lord. But it's the Son of God saying it. So when Jesus begins to give an analogy, could I say that His disciples have His utmost attention? So much so that the Holy Spirit could use the Apostle John to quote Him word for word some years later. And it's just, you ever heard something that, you know, it was literally so gripping that you could, you just remember every word of it? Now, even if you struggle with memorization... Some of you ladies, you know, if somebody offends you and they say something, you can remember every single word that they said. No, this is exactly what you said. I don't know how many times I have to confess. I don't know how many times I've casually said something that people remember every word of. 
They were just sitting there and whatever they're thinking or whatever they take it. I mean, they remember what I said. And they can remember. Well, sometimes for the wrong reasons, for the right reasons, his disciples would have said, whoa, this is a statement that he's making. Now, some teaching here. So this is a little a bit of an interlude. The blind man's being healed, but we're not hearing a story about someone else that Jesus saved here. We're hearing some application that Jesus is making about salvation, about being saved. So what's the theme of John? You might believe. You might believe. So if Jesus is trying to help His disciples know what they need to know so that they can believe, then He wants them to know that it's important as well what you don't believe or what you believe instead of this. This is an exclusive message today. If you're one of those people that is, oh, you know, all roads lead to heaven, all paths lead to God, my friend, this is Jesus saying, no, not at all. Okay, so He says, He that entereth, the Bible says in verse uh, 1, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and the robber, and a robber. The motivation of a thief to go in another way is because of they're trying to avoid the shepherd. Right? The shepherd's the guard. He's the one who watches the sheep. And the motivation for someone, a shepherd, or anyone that has the right to go into the sheep, can go in through the door. doesn't have to disguise himself. By the way, be careful of people that don't want to tell you what they think or what they believe. Uh, I was uh, watching a documentary on... Uh, on Christian science, which is, of course, you know, neither Christian nor science, That's a right. couple of weeks ago. And I was uh, just listening to some things about the founder. You know, when you get to a certain level, they have different levels. I think there's 10, but they lost a couple because a guy defected and, or died or something and stole a couple levels of their, you know. But uh, when you, I think it's level four that they, they start teaching as you have all these aliens attached to you to and, uh, you know, these things you have to do. Well, they, you, no, no Christian scientist will tell you that. That they believe that you know, at this certain level, they, they teach you that you have all these aliens attached to you that you have to access. That's just stupid, isn't it? I mean, just silly, just, you know, ridiculous and spooky and so forth. Uh, but the Christian scientists aren't going to tell you about that. You go down here to the reading room on the corner, and they're not going to tell you that you've got aliens attached to you. They're sneaky about what they believe. You've got to get up in, you know, Tom Cruise level before you get to know about aliens being attached to you. Now, I'm making fun just a little bit. Perhaps I shouldn't because it is a serious thing. But do they try to tell you they're Christian and they're not? They try to tell you it's science and it's not. They're very, very sneaky, very dishonest about what they believe. Mormons won't tell you the truth about Joseph Smith. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses won't tell you the truth about Charles Taze Russell. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists won't tell you the truth about Ellen White. And you can go on and on and on and on and on about people that have cover-ups and hide. And they, they're, what they're trying to tell you is this is the way to heaven, this is the way to God. But they're going a different way than what Jesus said. Now I'll tell you, the main thing that shows you whether or not something is true is what they do with Jesus. Some years ago, we had a Sunday school series, and perhaps we'll have it again soon. It was uh, called The Essentials of Salvation. Matter of fact, uh, next Sunday morning, I'm going to play one of the interviews for our Sunday school we have right now on how to reach your religious friends. I'm going to play the interview that I did with the Roman Catholic priest. And you should come. You should watch it. And uh, the, the, one of the things that you realize is that the priest knows the truth, but he's being very disingenuous. And as we were having that Sunday school series as a, as a group, we collectively decided, we said, what are some things that you absolutely must believe in order to have eternal life, or that you can't believe in order to have eternal life? And we, we really settled on two things, the Word of God and the person of Christ. You, just, you can't be off on the Bible being God's Word and have any notion about what truth actually is. And so if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, you just can't be saved. Now I know there are people that have undermining things that they believe, like they think the Bible has mistakes in it. I think they still believe it's the Word of God. They just don't think about how that the one belief contradicts the other. But it's an important thing. The person of Christ. Listen, Jesus is who He says He is or He can't be God. And here is a passage of Scripture where he's expressly stating that. He's saying very, very emphatically, I am the door. He says it later on, but he says, the person, first of all, I want to tell you, before I tell you what the door is, he says, any person that comes into the sheepfold, any other way is a thief and a robber. And notice he uses the analogy of sheep. Sheep are people. It's interesting in our context, 
Jesus says there are some sheep that aren't in this fold yet, but I'm going to get them in the fold. And so in general, people are sheep. Believing or unbelieving, people are sheep. And so I say, well, sheep and goats, you know, these are believers, these are unbelievers. Well, in general, sheep are people. And one of the things about sheep is that they do need a shepherd. Now, Jesus is the shepherd. I'm a pastor, this is point me in the word uh, for under-shepherd, the word for shepherd. And that's a biblical church office the Bible teaches about. But I'm not the shepherd Jesus is. I'm not the way to eternal life. Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church is a Bible-preaching, Gospel-preaching church. Unapologetically so. And I, as, long as, as long as I'm alive, I hope it'll always be. I don't know if it'll always be a Gospel-preaching church, but it is today. And it will be as long as I have a say and you have a say in it. But Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church is not the shepherd. It's not the sheepfold. Jesus is the door. Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church is not. Uh, there's a false doctrine in uh, Baptist theology, and I'm sorry to say it, but they teach that uh, you know the door to the body of Christ is through the local church. And Jesus contradicted that very, very expressly in John chapter 10. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the door. We're going to see that in the context today. I just want to tell you, you may have a religion. And the religion may say you need the seven sacraments. And my friend, that's not Jesus. You may have a religion, and the religion says, you know, you have to pray five times daily, and you have to submit to the will of Allah. That isn't Jesus. You may meet individuals that say, well, what we believe is very, very similar. We have different names for our deities. We have uh, different ways of doing the same thing. It's very similar. Can I say to you that it isn't Jesus? Jesus is God's Son. He's a person. He isn't anybody else. He isn't the mythical God of light. He is the Son of God. He is the source of light. He is the Creator God. And the person of Christ is a non-negotiable when it comes to going through the door. You can't say, well, you know what, there are many ways to do the same thing. We have the creed, or we have the confession, or we have these things. And yes, Jesus is part of that. Jesus isn't part of anything. He is everything. And so, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we reject anything otherwise. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell His disciples. He's trying to say, hey, you can't just stay in Judaism and be open to me being something important. I can't just be a prophet. I'm the Son of God. I am the way. I am the means for eternal life. Moving forward then, let's go ahead and look, if you would please, down to verse 2. He says, He that entereth, or he says, first of all, a person is a sheep, or as a, I'm sorry, climbs up some other way. It's a thief and a robber. In verse 2, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. I am fortunate enough never to have raised sheep myself. I just have to say I'm, I'm one of the privileged uh, few in the population that uh, is not a shepherd. I did get to see when we were traveling through Greece a couple of weeks ago, I did see a lot of shepherds. And I always wonder why they, you know, what they need shepherds for. And I think it's to make the sheep graze where they're supposed to. Uh, they actually have to have shepherds with, with sheep, which is a little incredible to me. Uh, if you walk in our family farm in Kansas, my granddad used to be a sheep farmer and he had hundreds of sheep. And if you walk on our farm in Kansas, one of the things you'll notice is that there are all these little like gullies going that, that are paths, and they're just worn down because sheep just seem to walk in the same path. They don't just walk across the pasture. They go one behind another, you know, you know, and go down a path, and they walk the same path every single time that they walk. And I think a shepherd has to make sure the sheep don't just walk in the same place and try to graze in the same dirt because they'll run out of food and they're not smart enough to move to where the grass is, is better. They'll eat it all the way down to the roots until it dies. And so sheep actually need a shepherd. And I'm not trying to you know, talk about sheep too much today, but there's a reason that sheep have, uh, well, that there are thieves and robbers. There's a reason that there are thieves and robbers and wolves because sheep do have value. Sheep have value. And by value, I do not mean value in the way that Jesus Christ looks at them. Jesus looks at sheep as sinners needing salvation, and He loves them for who they are. He loves them because He just loves them. But uh, a false teacher or a thief or a robber doesn't value the sheep. He's not interested in raising and nurturing up the sheep and helping them to be healthy and have a good life. He's interested in plundering them. He wants to get their wool. He wants to make mutton chops out of them. 
and uh, lamb, leg of lamb and so forth. He wants to eat them. He wants to devour them. And he's not a shepherd. A shepherd takes care of his sheep. He loves his sheep. He values his sheep. A thief and a robber wants to grab and kill and butcher it. And you know that's what religion is. It's small wonder individuals like uh, you know Joel Osteen and Jesse Duplantis and individuals are so into send me your seed of faith. Send me this and this and this and this. And so that I can... Why? Because sheep have value. They have monetary value. Oh, it's no wonder that organizations want to amass huge congregations of people so that uh, they can be the biggest and the greatest and they can have the benefits of that because sheep have value. They see sheep the way a thief or a robber does. Now, I'm not calling everybody that's grown a large church a thief and a robber. I'm just calling most of them that. And so it's just a you know, very, very general statement. If you think it's the person that you love, it certainly could not be. And so uh, just, just, I'm just trying to help us understand something, that sheep have value, and if somebody sees a sheep not as a, I can pour into them, I can invest in them, I can help them to grow, they're a thief and a robber. If it's, we want to be the biggest, we want to be the best, you're just a piece, you're just a tool to our growing our organization or to me getting my $50 million jet, whatever it is. I do need a $50 million jet, or at least a jet of any kind. Uh, you know, I th I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, the reality of it is, is that person is not a shepherd. And Jesus is clearly identifying, he says, a, a, a shepherd goes through the door. A shepherd goes through the door. If you want to know whether someone's a thief or a robber, they don't go through the door. It's incredible how many people try to say well, that all roads lead to heaven. Or you can't say that Jesus is the only way. Or you have to be careful about, you know, Jesus is the only way for me, but, you know, for other people, you know, those sort of statements because those people are thieves and robbers. And Jesus wants the disciples to know how exclusive this is. It is important. It matters. You know how Paul put it. Remember how Paul put it when he talked about Christ being risen uh, from the dead according to the Scriptures? And we're talking about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And he said, if Christ be not risen, your faith is in vain, you're getting your sins, and we're false teachers, and all these things. You know, Jesus didn't just come and die for funsies. He, he did, wasn't just, did, I don't have anything to do, and so I think I'll go and suffer and become, uh, become a servant of men, and uh, live a life uh, where I serve men and ultimately die for their sins, and that'll be an option for people. But Jesus came because He, he is the only way. He's the door of the sheep. The person of Christ and the work of Christ are essential. And so, in verse 3, Jesus said to him, The porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Now, uh, in, if you ever read, if you want an interesting book, particularly if you have children, you want to read bedtime stories, I recommend for you uh, Bill Rice's book. Not Bill Rice the Third, but Bill Rice the Second's book. Uh, Cowboy Boots in Darkest Africa. And he tells about his trip to Africa, which was at a really unique time, and uh, it's just it's a really an amazing amount of stories, and they all have moral uh, tales at the end of them. But he talks about how that he was traveling one time, and he, uh, yeah, this may not have been to Africa, maybe another one of his stories. You might have to buy a few of his stories to get this one. But uh, his books. Uh, he talks about how they stopped by a well, and this may have been on a trip to Israel or something like that. A bunch of shepherds came to water their sheep, and all of the shepherds just. They were all happy to see each other. God's well at the same time. They all started talking, and their sheep just got all mixed up, like just hundreds of sheep, you know, all just milling around all in one, one uh, group. And he thought, well, I'm going to stick around and wait to see this, try to see them try to sort out their sheep when they all go to leave. And, uh, but he said when they went to leave, the, each shepherd would just go, mm, brr, mm, brr, and the sheep knew their voice. Mm. And when they left, their sheep just followed them. They just sorted themselves and just followed them. And that's what a shepherd is. Sheep, my sheep know my voice. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And so that's exactly, if you understood, if you were unfortunate enough to have to raise sheep, then you'd understand that. You'd know that your sheep, they recognize their voice and recognize someone else's voice. And So that's an important aspect of shepherding. And Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Hey, isn't that great to know that, that, that uh, truth has a ring to it? It has a sound to it? There's just something different, wasn't there? The time you heard the gospel preached and the Holy Spirit of God just gripped your heart and said, that's so. You can hear religion and you can hear motivational speeches and you can be thrilled by philosophy and those sort of things, but there's something different about Jesus. Amen. He has a sound to Him. He has a voice to Him. He has an attitude to Him. Jesus never tried to get your wolf. Jesus right. isn't trying to get something from you. 
Jesus is laying down his life for you, and there's just something about that kind of a shepherd that has a distinct sound. He's the only kind of shepherd. In verse 4, when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. In verse 5, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now the question for you is, if you follow someone who teaches something that contradicts Jesus, what does that make you? Well, not a sheep. In verse 6, this parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. They said, yeah, yeah, we know that about sheep. What do you mean? Well, now he gives them the second set of verilies. Then said Jesus unto them again, Amen, Amen. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. I'm the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. There's a lot of false Christ. Many antichrists. There always are. Every single Passover, false Judaism, says to somebody as they sit down for their Passover meal, they say, check the door. See if Elijah's coming. And they're looking for a false Christ. And there have been a lot of false Christs, a lot of, quote, Elijahs that have come. But John the Baptist was the actual Elijah, and Jesus was the actual Messiah. He was the Passover lamb. And they're celebrating a Passover without the lamb. It's not sheep. It's false religion. It's false God. All kinds of religions that imitate the true thing. A lot of thieves and robbers. And that's all religion is. Religion is lumped and classified as one group, thieves and robbers. And Jesus is the door. And He's the only door, and there isn't another door. You come in some other way, you're a thief, and you're a robber. In verse 9, I am the door. By me. And this is a, this is a means... It's by means of me, by myself. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find the pasture. Now, friend, this is not complicated. Pastor, I don't know if I'm a saved or not. Did you go through the door? What's the door? Jesus. Jesus. Well, I'm not sure if I went through the door or not. Well, did you go through Jesus? Well, you know, I've always been a really good person. Wrong door. That's right. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I've, you know, I was born religious. I was born in the church. Wrong door. Wrong door. Well, you know, uh, my grandma. Wrong door. Are you saying about that? Are you saying that all the good things that I've done? Wrong door. How'd you get saved? Jesus. And with Jesus, you can go into the fold. You can go out of the fold. And you can find pasture, but it's the right door. He's the way that you enter into eternal life. The sheep folds eternal life. Now, it's not teaching you can lose your eternal life. It's saying there's a way in. There's a way in the right way. Hey, are, are, are believers supposed to be religious? It's kind of a trick question, isn't it? You know, I go to church religiously. I read my Bible religiously. I pray religiously. And by religious, I do not mean I'm trying to earn worth or merit for myself. I mean, I do it regularly. I mean, I'm convinced about it. Uh, I don't miss church. I don't miss the assembling of themselves together. And it isn't only because I'm the one who has to lead the services. I didn't miss church before I led the services. Why? Well, because I, I, I believe what the Bible says about not forsaking the assembling of themselves together. I believe that anything that Jesus says we ought to do, we ought to just do. And you know, you can do something religiously that's good, but you can't trust the religion to get you to heaven. It's because I go to church, I'm going to heaven. It's because I read my Bible, I'm going to heaven. I do those things because Jesus is the door. is isn't just religion. is isn't any religion at all. But I do some things religiously because of who Jesus is. You know how I get in? Through Jesus. It's the only means... Well, Pastor, what if you don't go to a really good church? Well, how are you getting saved? You know, there are some people that don't go to a really good church, but they've entered by the right door. They've gone in the right door. They ought to find a better church, but that isn't how you get saved. You don't get saved by going to the best church. You get saved by going through the right door. Yeah. Church is important. How you worship, how you grow, how you serve, those things are important. But anybody that will make those things the means for eternal life telling you to go through the wrong door. Wrong door! Jesus is the only way. 
Now there's some I am statements. He makes a con <clears throat> contrasting statement after he said, I'm the door. He contrasts with the thief. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. What is the motive of a person who will hold the soul of someone in their grip, in their power? What's the motive of someone that would hold the soul of another person in their power? What? Destruction. To destroy them. Ultimately, you say, Pastor, but they just they want power for themselves. What would made it motivate someone? That's demonic. That's satanic. Isn't it? Uh, listen, I have spoken to individuals who are leaders in religion. And I have, I have talked to them about things that they know are not so that they believe. And my conclusion as I converse with them is that they know they're not teaching the truth. They know they're frauds. They know they're phonies. What could be the ultimate motive? Well, it could be, we well, say, Pastor, well, they just want to fleece the sheep. You know, they're benefiting by the religion. You don't give the Satan very much credit. The fact is, is that there is a such thing as evil in this world. And any person who would willfully, knowing that they are not the way, that they're not the door, would try to misdirect someone to go through them or their religion. Let's call it what it is. That's evil. That's a thief and that's a robber. And that's a person who's trying to destroy people. You know, there are individuals who because of their pride and unwillingness to confess that they're wrong, know that their religion what they're teaching people is false. And yet they still claim to be the door. Because they'd rather someone went to hell than go through some embarrassment or just be honest and confess that that what they've learned and what they've taught isn't so. Man, I've met family members that know that their religion is false. They know that it isn't true. But rather than forsake dead religion, they'd rather go to hell and have their family go to hell. That's a thief and a robber. The fact is, is that eternal life is the most important matter that any person, that any person can deal with. You don't have a more important matter in any person's life. And Jesus is saying, I'm the only way. I'm the door to the sheep. Let's look at a couple more I am statements as quickly as we can. Here's a couple more. Uh, he, he contrasts. He says, I'm a good shepherd. The thief doesn't come. He comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. I'm come. They might have life. They might have it more abundantly. That's what you get when you come to Jesus. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd. There's a bad shepherd, there's a good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. As the good shepherd doesn't eat the sheep, doesn't uh, plunder the sheep. The good shepherd protects the sheep and gives himself for them. The hireling is, is, a different, uh, is different than that. You know, the, the most impressive things is you read the story of David as he was a shepherd. King David. What is the great thing about David as king of Israel? There just wasn't a man that was as humble and loved God and God's people as much as King David. David is still the beloved king of Israel to this day. Because when he was a shepherd, man, a lion tried to come and get the sheep. And he attacked the lion. And he killed it. A bear tried to get the sheep. And a young lad killed the bear. Those aren't made up stories. He did that. Why? Because he was not going to let anything harm his sheep. And if anything harmed his sheep, he'd die first. You know, a hireling won't do anything for his sheep. A hireling will take grandma's rent money, but he won't give a penny of his own. Isn't it so? I mean, I've, I've heard the charlatans on TVN. You know, you may be very, very poverty stricken. It might be that you're on a fixed income and you know you only have so much money and it won't even go. It's like the widow's might. It won't even pay enough this week. Sow your seed of faith. Send me that $100 that you have and God will bless you for it. He's a thief. That's right. He's a robber. And he'll steal grandma's rent money for his own benefit and doesn't care a bit about hurting a, a, an elderly widow woman or an old lady and doesn't care about hurting a family and hurting uh, people's children. He doesn't care about you going without. He's a thief and he's a <clears throat> robber. There's a bunch of them out there. They're charlatans. They're thieves and they're robbers and religion is nothing more than their means to manipulate people. I know people that use religion to control people. I've met guys, there's a, there are all kinds of people that are pastors. 
It's amazing how they throw the term. I'm a pastor. Well, where's your flock? Well, I don't, you know, I don't, uh, don't have a flock, but I'm a pastor. I'm an, I'm an ordained minister. Well, minister is a servant. Who are you serving? Where? The fact is, is that they're a thief. They're a robber. They're just driving a BMW. They're driving a. I'm not saying BMW's bad. They're driving a. You know, they they're driving the. You know, two hundred thousand dollar Rolls Royce. Why? Because. Because they're getting something from the sheep. And it's incredible. You look at the you look at some pastors and you look at their congregations. Their congregations are poor as dirt, and they're driving fancy cars. What does it mean? Well, it means that they're a fraud. They're a charlatan. Is what it means. A, a good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd, not some person. You hear me? Jesus is a shepherd. Any pastor tries to tell you he's the way, he's the one, he's going to teach you truth you never found anywhere else, he's a liar. He's a thief. He's a robber. And then he's a hireling. The hireling fleeth because he's a hireling and careth not for the sheep. You know, there are men in Baptist churches that, as far as shepherding goes, are hirelings. You know, to me, a hireling lasts about two years. You see, all kinds of churches call a pastor and he lasts until the first conflict, or the first difficult thing, the first time they have to go through something as a church, and he's out of there. You know, Jesus is the real shepherd, but if you are an under-shepherd, you're going to act like Jesus does. You're going to stick with people. You're going to stay with them. You're going to be with them when, you, when they need you. You're not going to run. You're not going to uh, look for, better, uh, for a better flock somewhere else. Man, I know preachers that are opportunists. Boy, they pastor a small church and somebody calls them and says, you know, we've got this package for you. We'll pay you this month and much, and this is the size of the congregation. This is where you get to live. And they're out of there. Why? Because they're a hireling. And I know them. They, I, I've, I know folks like that. I don't know the hearts of any man, but I can see what someone does and tell what's in their heart a lot of times. In verse 8, 14, I am the good shepherd, know my sheep, and am known of mine. It's a personal relationship with Jesus, my friend. A personal relationship with Jesus doesn't say, come to confession and I'll tell God what you said and I'll tell you what He said. I know my sheep and am known of mine. Any person that tells you that they are a shepherd of the sheep, but they don't point you to the good shepherd, is a hireling. He's a thief. He's a robber. He says, As my Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, I love this statement, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Well, there's another congregation, but they're different than this one. They believe some different things. Now, it's one fold, one shepherd, one truth. And they may not be in the fold yet, but Jesus is going to go find them. The 90 and 9. There's 99 sheep, and the shepherd has one sheep that's missing, and he goes out and he finds it. And he brings it back, and he says, Rejoice with me, my sheep, which was lost is found. The good shepherd not only cares for his sheep, but he cares to have sheep. He wants them. You're here this morning and say, does God even care about me? I don't even know if God cares. No, Jesus is the kind of shepherd that wants you so much that He went to the cross. And He offered Himself freely. He said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Which sheep does the good shepherd want? All of them. Man, there are some religions, there are some churches today where they throw around this you know, reprobate doctrine nonsense. And they love to say, as soon as somebody doesn't agree with them about something, oh, he's a reprobate, he's not saved, he's lost. And boy, they want him to be lost. They want him to go to hell. You know what Jesus wants? He wants for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the way Jesus is. That's the way the good shepherd is. He wants the sheep. He desires the sheep. He looks for the sheep. And you know something? That's most of us, isn't it? Jesus found you. You didn't find Jesus. He found you and He brought you into the fold. Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. He's an eternal shepherd. He's the kind of shepherd that dies for His sheep so that they can have eternal life, but He also is raised up. And death and hell are conquered by the kind of shepherd that He is. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. And I have power to take it again. Notice that statement. It is one thing to raise the dead. It's another thing to raise yourself. Jesus here is making a comment about the kind of shepherd He is on the basis of His deity as God. He's going to raise Himself from the dead. 
He's going to lay his life down. And here he's telling his disciples the kind of a shepherd he is. Oh, they're thrilled with the miracles that he's done. But he's letting them know right now from this point in John and forward the Gospel of John, we're going to be looking at Jesus dying for sin. Dying for sinners because he's a shepherd who lays his life down. He does it voluntarily and he raises himself up as well. He's a unique kind of shepherd. He is God. Then in verse 19, we see the response to the shepherd. That's our conclusion. There was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these saints. A division. Some believed one thing and the others believed another. And they said this. Many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? He's crazy. Saying things like that. That's crazy. And the other people said, He can't be crazy because He opened the eyes of the blind. And you know today, there's a division. You either respond to the truth of Jesus, the Good Shepherd, by saying, no way, I don't believe it. It's crazy. There's got to be another way. There's got to be other ways. You can't say that all the devout religious people in the world will go to hell if they reject God's Son. That's what God's Son said. And either you are mad and say that He's mad, or you say, you know, He opened the eyes of the blind. And so I believe. Which is it then? What of it then? Jesus is the Good Shepherd. He is the door to the sheep. Anyone that comes in any other way is a thief and a robber or a hireling. But Jesus gave His life for His sheep and He laid it down of Himself and He raised Himself up again. And can I say to you, that's the kind of a shepherd that you and I need. That's the kind of door that we need. We're talking about the door to eternal life. Have you entered the door? Because the door is Jesus. Have you gone to God for Jesus? And if you have not, my friend, it isn't because God doesn't want you to. It's incredible how someone could say, I don't want a God like that. They could reject a God who wants them. You don't want Him, but He wants you. What kind of a person are you? Well, probably not a sheep. And you're not the door. So you're a person that fits in a category of thief or robber, trying to break in another way. You can't do it. You won't get in. Because Jesus is the only true door. Father, I pray that You would help us. Help us to understand the importance, the value of this truth. That You would cause us, by the power of Your Spirit, to know it's true. And as a result, to believe in Jesus, we pray. In His name. Before I finish uh, our service, before we conclude this morning, you could open your head, your eyes, and and uh, look up. If you would open your your hymn books to page 246, I want to sing a hymn of invitation this morning. And during the invitation, we'll just open it up. If you would want someone to pray with you, or if you'd want to just having understood Jesus is the door of the sheep, you know you don't have to know everything about God to believe everything about God. Do you know that? You say, Pastor, I need to learn some more about Jesus before I can believe in Him. Well, if today you believe that Jesus is the door to the sheep and that everything the Bible says about Jesus is true, do you know that's enough that you could just receive it? You can learn a lot more about Jesus later. But if you receive Him for who He is, the only way for salvation, He'll receive you. And you can grow in faith and all those things later on. But there's no reason why any person here today could not believe what the Holy Spirit has witnessed is true from the Word of God that Jesus is the only way. He's the door of the sheep. So as we sing softer, softly and tenderly this morning, remember that's the attitude that Jesus has toward His sheep. And as we stand and as we sing, uh, if you haven't received Jesus as your Savior, would you this morning? Would you just say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I want to, God, I want you to be my Father. I want the free gift of eternal life. And Jesus got that uh, privilege for us. He wanted it for us by dying on the cross for our sins so that we could uh, receive God's judgment by being raised again uh, from the dead. And you can be saved just by believing. Will you stand? And will you sing with me as we sing softly and tenderly? Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling